We're involved in actually three different areas. Um, wind, microhydro, like hydro generation and solar, but over the years it's evolved into primarily solar uh, PV. Right. So direct uh, production of electricity from sunlight. One of the things about solar is that it's very accessible compared to many of the other forms of renewable energy. Most sites that we encounter are viable for solar generation, whereas with, with wind and microhydro, good sites are fewer and further between. So as a result, it makes solar more predictable. Well, well, I think Greg and I have seen this where the excitement in people's eyes or their, in their heart, it just gives them an, a feeling of empowerment and a sense of of being able to be independent. We just did one last week. The family was just so thrilled because they now could work without generators. The costs of deploying uh, particularly grid-connected solar systems, which generate back into the grid right. and, and reduce a home or a business's dependence on, on grid electricity, has been dropping dramatically over the last five years uh, globally. The other thing with the sun is very simple to get involved in a project as a homeowner or a business owner for a very small investment. You can build a system with one panel, whereas with other projects, wind or micro hydro, there's always a significant capital investment, something supernatural about it, you know. This energy source in the sky, which just happens to be there, that we take for granted, and the amount of energy from the sun on a daily basis is just staggering. The amount of energy striking the surface of Texas over that 12-month period is far in excess of the energy in all of the oil and gas that Texas have, has ever extracted. Oh, okay. but I remember in my teen years where I, where I clearly felt I knew more than he did, he used to shout at me uh, to turn the lights out. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I used to laugh at him. I came up with this rather naive argument that it was actually less expensive to just leave them on because the action of turning them on and off would <laughs> wear out the light bulbs faster. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I remember that discussion to this day, and it, and it just makes me smile, because you know, in, in the end, my dad was right, as most fathers usually are. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Ben inspired me, actually, just seeing them in action and their passion about all these kind of things. It is so empowering when you can make your own power. Well, obviously, oil is a low-hanging fruit, the easy way in the beginning, but now we're at the point where we need to make a change, and it's just exciting to be part of that. It starts with the oil industry. Humble beginnings in Texas has just grown to be be what society relies on. It's worked quite well, but that error is, is drawing to a close. It's been a good run. People like Elon Musk are helping us find solutions as far as transportation. As far as challenges, one of the biggest things we're up against is that there's no government support with any of this stuff. When you talk to people, they, they always say, well, what kind of incentives are in place and those kind of things, and it really it's a deal breaker for a lot of it. Like if there was some small thing that would help people along the way, it's one of the biggest challenges to getting people to do installations, for sure. Our power systems in BC are very reliable and well-designed. BC Hydro does a great job of delivering electricity, and it's very expensive to do that. And so in recent years, we've seen rates going up, and projections are that they'll continue to, and it's basically catch-up. People are still not noticing that rates are on the rise, and many of the people we talk to still think that BC has the cheapest electricity in North America, and we don't, whether they be homes or businesses. And it seems that in North America, there's much, much more emphasis on aesthetics, contrary to countries like Germany, where aesthetics are important, but where you might not even be able to get a building permit unless you can demonstrate that your building is near or exceeding net zero in terms of its, its electricity use. In BC, people are far more likely to spend an extra thirty-five or $40,000 on uh, granite countertops and expensive exotic wood cabinets, which look nice, than they would be on a rooftop solar system, which will dramatically reduce the environmental impact of the house and reduce their long-term operating expenses. Part of what we do involves a huge educational component where right. we help people see that there's a different way of doing things, potentially a better way of doing things, right. and that the way we look at our homes and businesses might not necessarily be uh, the only way to look at it. So while it's a challenge, it's also one of the most interesting parts of our work. 
because solar is so new, many people really haven't had a chance to learn about how it works and how effective it is. One of the, the key things that we see all the time is people really don't understand how well solar works in BC. Often people will say, well, solar just doesn't work in Canada, it only works in more tropical countries. For many years, Germany was the, the world leader, and they're still using solar a lot, but it turns out that Japan and China, and more recently the US, are accelerating their solar programs at a higher rate. Well, how well does solar work in BC compared to those other countries? Well, in the Kamloops area, for instance, we, we can expect to harvest somewhere around 1200 kilowatt hours a year for each thousand watts of solar that we deploy. And so to most people that's just a number and it means nothing unless we compare it, right? In Germany, you know, the world's aggressive adopter for a long time, you'd think, well, it must work a whole lot better there. Well, in fact, in Germany, they only harvest in the order of 860 kilowatt hours a year. So it's, it's literally 30% less effective in right. Germany. Right. So the reasons we're not using it as much as we are have nothing to do with how well it works. It works great. Right. One of the biggest advantages uh, around this discussion is if we look at Germany or if we look at California or if we look at Ontario where you know their solar programs are more aggressive and have been more well established for a right. number of years. If you were to ask a real estate agent, you know, will a solar system improve the resale value of my home? They have clear answer. A study done in California recently showed very clearly that if you deploy solar to your home, that you will recover when you sell the home a huge portion, if not all, of your initial capital investment. Here in BC, how do I increase the value of my home? You're more likely to get the advice that you should install granite countertops or, or hardwood floors. Whereas, in fact, in the next few years, as things continue to change with higher rate increases and hopefully lower solar costs, what's been happening in other parts of the world with solar will happen here. And eventually, we'll see the, 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 the point where solar systems on your rooftop will increase the value. Right. We know it will. We don't have to look far to see that it will. Gotcha. Right. Grid parity is the point where it costs the same to buy your electricity from the sun or less than it would to buy it from from the grid. Right. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, some work was done by the BC Sustainable Energy Association to try to project when that might happen in BC. And uh, at that time, they determined that it would likely happen after 2025. Right. Whereas in fact, if you if you work out the, uh, the present costs of solar systems and amortize that cost over the lifetime of the system, and look at how much energy it'll produce over its 30 year life and and compare that to what it's going to cost to buy step two residential electricity from BC Hydro which is currently at about 12.4 cents uh, we are actually at grid parity or perhaps we've even surpassed that point when we talk about that step two residential elect electricity which is the most expensive electricity and again this is an ed educational issue like most people haven't had a chance to really even think about that right in fact most of the people we talk to aren't even aware that you can connect your solar system to the grid and generate back into the grid the net metering program that which is a wonderful program bc hydro has people are just generally unaware and so it goes back to the exciting challenge we have to to raise awareness right uh, one of the biggest things though is uh, being aware of your electricity consumption I mean, and that can be done with installing a meter in your home and then paying attention to what you're using on your electrical panel you would install a meter that's showing how much power you're using at any given time okay. or over a period of time and then you can go through your house and see that I'm using a lot of power and then turning things on and off okay. and seeing what is being used. The one that we install for the most part is called the Nurio, but there's a, there's a lot of different versions. You can see it on your cell phone or your PC oh, okay. uh, from anywhere in the world. Oh, okay. And it can actually also, if you happen to have a solar system installed, as I do on my roof, I can see moment by moment uh, how much of the home's consumption the solar is, is offsetting. My wife just instantaneously got so excited, like she's watching it many, right. many times during the day. Right. And she'll come running downstairs and say, look, at, we're, we're using 2,000 watts. What are you doing down here? <laughs> 
So that alone, just being aware of your consumption yeah. is, is huge. One thing that BC Hydro focuses on is actually energy conservation before generation, because that's the easiest first step for most homeowners. LED lighting is number one. You reduce your lighting consumption by up to 85%. That's number one. And then more efficient appliances. Refrigeration technology is, is progressed. I'll go back to my dad. If he was still alive, he'd still be saying, turn out the lights. He'd say, get rid of that incandescent lamp and make it an LED. Right. The other thing he'd say is, close the doors and windows. Don't leave them open all day long. We want some ventilation, but if the air conditioning is yeah. running, then you shouldn't have your windows open. It's always astonishing to me that clotheslines are outlawed in, in various cities. You know, uh, Camel's not one of them, yeah. just for the record. <laughs> I, we did that research. Thanks. No, there's no bylaws in Camel's. <laughs> <laughs> It's been done for centuries, it works great, and it saves a lot of energy. Conservation really is huge. To install a substantial solar system without first looking at your consumption and how you can reduce it is not very responsible. We always recommend first looking at energy consumption. Typically what we'll do is when a client calls us in with questions about solar, we'll look at their consumption, annual consumption, and look at how much step two they're using and then ask the question, how can you reduce your step two? Why is your step two there at all? And if there's ways to reduce that, that's the first step, no pun intended. Once you've done everything that makes good financial sense around reducing your consumption, because it doesn't all make sense. Like sometimes retrofitting new windows and in increasing insulation levels can be very, very expensive. And honestly, for a lot, some of those renos, the payback time can be very long. But once you've done the most responsible and low-hanging fruit kind of things, then you can install a solar system, a modest system, and it'll have a much larger impact than it would have had if you hadn't done the conservation first. For me, raising awareness. I hope that that'll be one of the big things that we can be part of doing in Kamloops, is raising awareness. Education component is huge. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's about being able to share share what we've learned, like being out there in the field, on the ground installing, share what works and what doesn't work, how solar can be used in your home and, and when it should be used. I think a spin-off of that is is hoping to see solar become much more commonplace. And and I think one of the keys to that is is helping people understand how well it works, how readily available it is for relatively modest investment. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, you don't you don't have to do a uh, a 10 megawatt solar farm to have an impact you know like like if one out of five homes in Kamloops had a modest system on their rooftop um, it would make an enormous impact right. on the energy situation uh, in, in Kamloops. With the advent of electric car having the ability to generate a drone home and actually charge your vehicle for uh, your transport needs it's spreading from being able to reduce your home hydro bill to actually be able to provide the power you need to get you around, to get you to work, to get you to the grocery store. This is happening now. There's homes in Kamloops right now oh, okay. that do that. Yeah, they yeah. plug in their Teslas. Very little maintenance on the vehicle. Very little maintenance on the solar system. It's pretty much maintenance free for its lifespan. It's just the upfront initial cost. And then of course the car, the batteries will eventually need to be replaced. It's pretty much renewable living. People, particularly businesses and industry, are becoming far more aware of energy use within their facilities. We've been getting a lot of inquiries around people needing help understanding where their electricity is going. Why is my consumption so high? What are the devices in my business or in my home that are using all that energy and, and, and how can we change that? And so that involves installing instruments to study the energy use patterns and ultimately lead to optimizing and reducing energy consumption. And this is going to be particularly important as our province grows industrially and, you know, and also there's more residential growth in helping the grid to be more reliable. In many other parts of the world, there are rotating power outages uh, because the grid can't keep up. The other thing is time of day billing, which hasn't happened yet in BC. But in many parts of the world, people are paying more for their electricity at various times of the day. And so it becomes important to know what your big energy consumers are so that, for instance, you're not 
drying your clothes or doing your vacuuming uh, during the most expensive energy times of the day. So it goes back to studying and raising awareness on what the consumption patterns are. What is interesting is that BC Hydro has different billing rates. So they have small, medium and larger commercial rates. And in the medium and large rates, businesses and, and industry are not charged simply on their consumption. They're also charged on their demand, which is basically the peak power usage. For instance, in our area, often peak power demand will happen during the hottest times of the year when buildings are heavily air conditioned. We are getting inquiries from a lot of commercial enterprises around how can we reduce our peaks to avoid those demand charges. And so one of the techniques that's being used in other parts of the world is using battery-based solar systems that will store energy okay. in the battery that can be later drawn on to reduce consumption at the times that peaks are occurring right. to shave the peaks and save the peak demand costs. Right. Solar fits in nicely with that scenario when we have peaks or super peaks which usually occur due to air conditioning in summer months around the 4 to 6 p.m. That's when solar is generating. It actually works to reduce those loads so it actually helps the grid. Solar dovetails nicely with the grid because it helps it get through those peak periods. A lot of the clients themselves, you know, people that are actually taking that step when there aren't the government incentives or all these other things to help them, but they're stepping up and oh, okay. doing the right thing, you know, like it's inspiring, really. I'll go back to my dad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely a role model for me, even though I didn't appreciate it at the time. <laughs> uh, there's so much I learned from my dad uh, around energy and practical skills, being comfortable with tools and problem solving and I mean he was tremendous at that. If he was still alive he'd be on the roofs with us doing okay. this work. He'd be very excited about it. There's some unsung heroes in BC Hydro. Our power system is really quite amazing when we consider right. the, the thousands and thousands of square kilometers uh, the terrain that our transmission system traverses for it to be as reliable as it is is to the point where we take it for granted outages are so rare i need to say kudos to bc hydro it really is internationally acclaimed within hydro itself there's people that have done a lot of work to make the net metering program happen one of those people is uh, Alevtina akapilatova who manages the net metering program when it first came out around 2006, and it was limited to 25 kilowatts of capacity. And because of her good work that's expanded, it's now up to 100 kilowatts. Ballard Power Systems, the founder of that company's original goal was to come up with a better battery to allow us to have an electric car. They kind of put BC on the map. But more recently, Elon Musk and his almost single-handedly bringing the electric car to market, just amazing to me. What's the payback? And that is a favorite question. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> My challenge to our community is to start asking that question more universally. Your hot tub, that recreational vehicle, or that new snowmobile, that payback question is really one of context. And the best way to illustrate that would be, let's say that we were running a contest. The prize was your choice of a new snowmobile, versus a rooftop solar system. In the Kamloops area, I think it's safe to say that most people would probably be more interested in the snowmobile. But if you took that same contest and brought it to the country of Nepal or Guatemala, where the countries are impoverished, and you offered them a snowmobile as a first prize, <laughs> they would think you're out of your mind, right? When they could have a solar system that would pump their water or help them educate their children because they have no other source of electricity. The future may be even better than it was with fossil fuel. We don't have to look too far afoot to know how the story is gonna end. Other parts of the world where right. this has taken off a long time ago, we have the benefit of learning from the others that have gone before us. Right. So really the solar industry is very, very mature when you right. look at it internationally even though in our experience here in BC it seems to be like it's just cutting edge. Fatima <laughs> <laughs> Close the lights. Close the lights. <laughs> when people ask how it works, I always like to say it's magic. There was a musical artist that wrote a song about solar a long time ago. Whoa, whoa, whoa it's magic. <laughs> <laughs>